Hello and welcome to our podcast. In this episode, we will be talking about Unraveling the Revelation, Part 5. In our last podcast, we addressed D.S. Warner's method of using 2,300 days found in Daniel 8, 14, as a means of establishing 1880 as a major milestone in church history. And also, this date is used on our Revelation charts. Now we want to look at another scripture that Brother Warner concluded was used as a prophecy and supported the year 1880 as well. That scripture is in Revelation, the 11th chapter, and verse number 11. It says, And after three days and a half, The Spirit of life from God entered into them, speaking of the two witnesses, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Brother Warner believed that this time period represented the Protestant age. He believed that it started in 1530 and ended in 1880. 1530 was the year of the Ashburg Confession, or the first Protestant creed. As we've already discussed, Brother Warner believed that 1880 was the opening of the Church of God era in which the pure Church of God was reestablished on the earth. It's also the year that Brother Warner published his first book, If you take 1880 and you subtract 1530, you have 350 years. Brother Warner believed that this represented a time period in which the prophecy could be described by three and a half days. Each day would represent 100 years. Therefore, a half a day would represent 50 years. So three and a half days would represent 350 years. So this day symbol, what does it mean? Does it mean 100 years? Certainly the word day is a small word, but it has a large impact, especially when used in symbolic language. When the Bible speaks of a day, it undoubtedly has various meanings. It does not always mean a 24-hour period. Let's look at scripture and get some examples. In 2 Peter 3.8, one day equals a thousand years. It says, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So there we see the day representing 1,000 years. In Ezekiel 4, verse number 6, one day equals one year. And we have already discussed that in the previous podcast. But that specific, uh, that specific scripture says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in prophecy, oftentimes a day is representing one year. In John 8.56, one day equals the entire time of Jesus' earthly presence, or 33 and a half years. That scripture says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And so we know that Jesus' earthly ministry, earthly ministry or earthly presence on earth represented 33 and a half years and his ministry represented three and a half years. John 9, 4. One day is said to equal the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, or three and a half years. That scripture says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Hebrews 3 Verses number 8 through 9, 
lets us know that one day equals 40 years. It says, Harden not your heart as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. So in that instance, one day represents forty years. In Second Corinthians 6, 2, one day is said to be an indefinite number of years during which the gospel is preached. That scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And in this particular instance, there is no reference to how long the day of salvation will last. Now, I'm going to go back and address what Brother C.W. Naylor said regarding the three and a half days or the 350 years of Protestantism. This was taken directly from the book that he wrote titled D.S. Warner and His Associates. The only other scripture used to prove 1880 was a prophetic year is the three and one half days in, of Revelation 11.11. 11. This is interpreted to mean three and one half centuries and to measure from A.D. 1530 to 1880. The interpretation that these three and one half days sig um, signify three and one half centuries has not one fact to sustain it. Nowhere else in scripture is a time prophecy where days signify centuries to be found. The only support that can be given to this interpretation is the support of the interpreter's word. It is pure assumption. It is a mere guess. It is an interpretation that has no standing. Chronologically, therefore, 1880 is not a prophetic year. And so we can see from this quote that C.W. Naylor, who also was a very popular pioneer in the Church of God, did not support the concept of three and a half days representing 350 years. On our next chart, we see Brother Warner's interpretation of the four church ages. The first church age was labeled the morning light and is supported by scriptures such as Isaiah 21, verse number 11 and 12. It was believed that this church age started in A.D. 30 and ended in A.D. 270. The second church age was known as the Papal Age and is supported by verses such as Revelations 12, verse number 6, and verse number 14. It was believed to have started in 270 and extended into 1530. The third church age, or the Protestant Age, as we have just discussed, was believed, was believed to have started in 1530 and extended unto 1880. And then the last church age, which was something unique to Brother Warner's interpretation as the previous Adventist interpretation of these um, scriptures did not include this particular church age. This was the fourth stage. The fourth age was called the church evening light age. And that was supported by scriptures such as Zechariah 14, verse number six and number seven. It started in 1880 and will end at the second coming of Christ. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about other predictions that were made by Brother Warner. Oftentimes, whenever people begin to have an interest in prophecy, they will begin to look at various passages and see timelines and references to what they believe support predictions. What we see here is an article that was published as a result of a reporter attending one of the meetings of the Gospel Trumpet Company 
or sp and specifically of Brother D.S. Warner, who had been preaching. This article was found in the new in the San Francisco Chronicle, which was out of San Francisco, California, on the 9th of October, 1895. Here's what it says. The end of time predicted. Set for the middle of the next century. This article was written in at Grand Junction, Michigan, October the 8th. It reads, Saints of God from all parts of the state are con are congregated here in the in great numbers. They packed the pavilion yesterday to listen to an address by D. S. Warmer, and that really was should have been Warner, editor of the Gospel Trumpet, on prophecy and revelation. Brother Warmer or Brother Warner diagrammed in his sermon on a blackboard, picturing out to his followers that eight 1896 would bring in a new epic in the church and that 1941 would be the end of time. Yesterday was a day of fasting and prayer to restore the sight of one of the preachers in the state of Washington. There's another article that's similar to this one that was found in the Topeka Daily Capital and also one in the Democratic Expounder, one being from Kansas and the other one being published in Michigan. Let me read that. Again, Grand Junction, Michigan, special. The saints of God from all parts of the state congregated at this place in great numbers and packed the big pavilion to listen to the address of D.S. Warmer, editor of the Gospel Trumpet, on prophecy and revelation. Brother, Brother Warmer diagrammed his sermon on a blackboard and pictured out to his followers that 1896 would bring in a new epic in the church and lead on to the millennium. He traced in his own way, year by year, epics which he said would mark the end of the world and declared that in 1941 time would be no more and the world would be wiped out. The followers of the church seemed to take his sermon in as gospel truth and declared the prophecy will be fulfilled. There was a day of fasting and prayer to restore the sight of one of, the, of their preachers in Washington State. So, Kind of like as we as we had the Associated Press, you can see that other papers picked up what had been written and also in some cases expanded upon it. So let's ask ourselves the question, what would happen in 1896? Or would Jesus be returning in 1891? There's an article in the Gospel Trumpet on October the 24th, 1895, on page 2, that's titled, Correction. And here's what it says. This was written by Daniel Warner. Some reporter from the Grand Rapids Papers is responsible for saying that on Sabbath, at the assembly meeting here, we taught that Christ would return and the world come to an end in A.D. 1941. And papers in Chicago and other cities have been republishing the same, some of them with additions, saying that we taught that the millennium was drawing near and that these things have been misrepresented, excuse me, in these things we have been misrepresented as the congregation knows. We did figure out the two epics of Daniel 12, 11, and 12, to fall due in 1896 and 1941. But instead of saying that this latter date would end time, we distinctively stated the contrary. 
and from the word proved that time and probation would yet extend beyond that date, at least a short period. But no one can tell the exact number of months or years. In January the 2nd, Gospel Trumpet Edition, 1896, page 1, we find the following. As we look back over the work of the past year and see what God is doing for his children, we can only lift our hearts the more in thankfulness to him for the leadings of his spirit and the manifestations of his power throughout the world among his believing children. The year 1896 has been looked forward to as a prophetic year and a fulfillment in prophecy in a wonderful manner and also a great upheaval in religious affairs. And the church has been advancing as never before since the Dark Ages in order to be ready for that conflict. According to the signs of the times, the end is not far distant. The devil has come down in great wrath, knowing that his time is short. He is deceiving and causing the people to be deceived. The word says, False Christ and false prophets shall arise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, the, poss the if possible, the very elect. But for the elect's safe, sake, whom he had chosen, he has shortened the days. Yea, he says in Romans 9.28, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. But he says, A remnant shall be saved. Who will be numbered among that remnant? It will only be those that obey God and walk in the light of his word. And so we see from this response in, the, in both of the articles that Brother Warner did believe that there would be a major event that would happen in 1896. Unfortunately, we do not have anywhere in which that event or that year is described as to what, would, what, might, what might take place in 1896. I have not been able to locate exactly what he was referring to. As for 1891, Brother Mortar makes it clear that he did not prophesy that the world would come to an end in 1941. But he did say that it would not last much beyond that date. Although no one could tell the exact number or months. So how did these two dates come about being? Well, he referenced in one of his articles, Daniel 12, 11 through 12. Let's read that. Verse number 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Verse number 12, Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. What Brother Warner did here was use the same method that the Adventists used, and also that particular date of 606 is shown on their chart. So when you calculate 606 and you add to it 1,290 days, that brings you to 1896. If you add to that 606, 1,305 and 30 days, that brings you to 1941. Now, as we have already discussed, this is all part of the 2,300 days that was used in describing what was happening in Jerusalem and how that the king of Babylon was going to release um, individuals to go back and reestablish the city. And um, I should point out that 
It's really important to understand that Brother Warner and also many church leaders of his day and many ch church leaders now are solidly convinced that the Old Testament literal events, things like visions and dreams uh, in certain individuals, places, things, things that are related to Israel, they see these as types and shadows and are a, believed to be a way to understand the prophetic hand of God governing the affairs of the New Testament church. Some examples of Old Testament types and shadows. The building and rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. The tabernacle and its furnishings. The journeys of the Israelites. Moses himself being a type of Christ and so forth. Often the allegory interpretation of Old Testament types and shadows are valued over the plain meaning of the scripture text. Indeed, types and shadows are some are symbolic of pictures, excuse me, they are symbolic pictures of some things that are yet to happen, but it's very difficult to know what God intended to be a type or a shadow and what merely was a historic event. I have talked to individuals that value, place so much value on the types and shadows and their interpretation of those types and shadows that they almost ignore what the written word says. They place so much value on it. <clears throat> and so that's a very common practice. Well, indeed, there are some things in the New Testament that were intended to be types and shadows. But just as in the natural when we were to when we to go and stand out in the sun and it would cast a shadow we can look at that shadow and often it will be very tall probably thinner than what we are and so it is a representation of a person that the sun is shining upon but it's not it lacks the details and it's just a representation the best way to know how someone looks is to look at them directly. And so this is true as well. We should place much more value on what the written word says than our interpretation of types and shadows. And so oftentimes people make the mistake and we end up with prophecies that are not fulfilled. Obviously, in this case, 1896 came and there was really nothing significant about it. Uh, unfortunately, Brother Warner died on December the 12th of 1895, so he did not even see the year 1896. I will end this section with a quote from C.W. Naylor, also taken from the teachings of D.S. Warner and his associates. Here he says, Brother Warner, in a meeting I attended, made the statement that the Lord had promised him that he should live until Jesus returned. Another brother recently told me he heard him make the same statement in Missouri on more than one occasion. However, Brother Warner died about six months, that was in December of 1895, after I heard him make that statement. Now, does that, are we trying to cast off in Brother Warner? Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. Um, he believed what he believed, and God blessed his life. He walked in what light he had. But on this particular issue, he had gotten it wrong. And so, thankfully, there were others that labored with him that were able to see beyond just what he taught, and in the case of Brother Regal, actually did not include the statements that I just read to you and the statements that we talked about in the previous podcast concerning the 2,300 years did not include that in the cleansing of the sanctuary. So that is what we're going to end with on this podcast. We look forward to sharing more with you in the near future.